Let me bring you up to speed. I'm, I've got, help me out a little bit, Fran. I've got a couple of maps. We're, we're going to go with the first missionary journey real quickly. We've, we've covered this. Uh, we see where the United States is. We've got Europe, and then we've got the Mediterranean, and we're going to zoom in there. And We looked at this area for the first missionary journey. We're going to zoom in a little bit further. And you'll see that Paul and Barnabas, they went to Cyprus, and they went through this area of uh, Galatia, and then returned, and then we had the, uh, the big debate take place um, on what requirements were expected of Gentiles, and then Paul and Barnabas, they had a bit of a, a, a breakup, and, and Barnabas and, and uh, Mark went back to Cyprus, and Paul and Silas went back to Derby and Lystra. So we've got the second missionary journey, which we started a couple weeks ago, where he ended up moving a little bit further into Greece and Athens. And, and some of you know Italy looks like the big boot. That's over here on the left-hand side. He didn't get quite as far as Rome on the second missionary journey. And we're about halfway through. We're going to zoom into that area. And we'll see that they left and they went across land this time. And they went back through Derby and Iconia and Lystra. And remember, that's, that's the area where, where Paul was basically stoned to the point where they thought he was dead and he drug him out and then he still went back into the town, right? And that's where they went back to and where even though circumcision wasn't a requirement of salvation, Paul still ended up having Timothy get circumcised so that his message would be more received by the Jews since he was part Jew. And so this was sort of the first part of, I think, a bigger message is where Paul's talking about we become all things to all people. And even though we have certain rights and certain things we're not necessarily required to do, we lay down our rights so that some people will be more ready to listen to us. I can tell you, if I went to a certain part of the world where women were required to wear certain coverings, and Charity was with me for her own safety, I would, I would expect for her to do that for two reasons. One, for her safety, and two, so that people might be more ready to listen to the actual message where there's some people that won't even listen to a message just because of the way we look. And that's unfortunate, but it's the world we live in. And so Paul, throughout this second missionary journey, we see him take different looks, but the gospel is always the same no matter where he goes. So anyway, after that area, they felt called to move further in towards this Asia area. And you, you might remember that the elder... Uh, Mark shared that for whatever reason, they felt that they, they were prevented from moving into this Asia area in Ephesus, and they even tried to go north into Bithynia and Pontius, uh, but they ended up getting to Troy, Troy or Troyus, and that's where he had this vision of the man calling from Macedonia, saying, come on over, we need you here, and so they, they went that way. Um, and, and that's where Thessalonians, Philippians, and Berea, and they had the agitators, and last week we were so blessed to have the message shared by Pastor um, uh, Sprecher, who was with us last week, and he, he, he left off talking uh, about those areas, and so I'm going to pick up in Acts chapter 17, verse 16, where he ended up leaving that area and moved down into Athens, and I want to spend most of the time today talking about Athens and Corinth, but he finishes off his missionary journey actually going back through uh, Ephesus, which was the area that he was prevented from going to earlier in the mission strip. And it's just such, such an important life lesson for us that sometimes we want to do something now and God says no, and we just think, well, I guess I'm not supposed to be there when it's really just a not yet. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I'll tell you, you never want to be in the right place at the wrong time. <laughs> it's like someone gives you a ticket for, for a plane and you... you end up there two months early, you're not going to be able to get on the plane. You're not going to be able to achieve the destination that God has for you if you're in the right place, but at the wrong time. So Acts chapter 17, verse 16 is where I'm going to pick up. Um, now remember, Paul has left for Athens, but he didn't bring the whole group yet. In fact, because there was some opposition that had been brought up in Berea by the Thessalonians that came down and stirred up trouble. trouble. But uh, we find that while he's there alone, he was provoked to do something and say something. Uh, verse 16. Now, while Paul awaited for them, meaning Silas and Timothy, and actually Luke is with them as well by this time, in, in, I, I believe that you'll see that when he was in Troy, 
Paul, who's writing the, the, the Acts of the Apostles, he shifts from talking about they to talking about we. So Luke, who wrote it, is now with this group. Um, and it's interesting to notice the times where he uses the they and when he uses the we. He talks about how they were in prison. <laughs> but so he somehow, I'm just, I'm just documenting this or, or something, but anyway, so... Um, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogues and with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. It almost seems as Paul would have preferred to have waited. I mean, the Lord did send them out in groups, two by two. And so he's in this unfamiliar city on his own, yet with what he's seeing around him, he felt provoked, like, I have to say something. I have to do something. It's interesting that other times, and when you compare it to what happened in Corinth, that it says the spirit kind of compelled him or pushed him. But this time it was maybe his own I felt provoked. Have you ever felt provoked to doing something? I just have to say something. I just have to do something. This is an interesting word that it uses here. Um, there's only one other place that I found in Scripture that it talks about it, and it's talking about don't be provoked quickly to anger. You know, don't be provoked. Um, but there was this thing. It tells us what provoked him. It was that they were given over to idols. It, just like any tourist would do, when you go into a new town or a new city, you want to explore the sites. And he educated himself on what these people were all about. Um, and it grieved him because of the, gra- ma- the magnitude of the idolatry that he saw around him. It says that they were given over to idols, which means the whole city was filled with idols. But I don't think it was just the statues that were in the city that filled the city, it was that they were given to the statues. They were given to this false religion, so to speak. This worldview, this idealism that they had rather than really a real, it wasn't an organized religion per se as much as it was a a way of thinking. But they were given over to it. So it says he reasoned in the synagogues and in the marketplace daily. And I've said this, I think, before. As we work our way through Acts, we notice that the spreading of the gospel isn't just a church thing. And when I say church thing, I mean the building. We know the church is not just a building, it is the people. But it's not something that takes place only inside the building, inside the synagogues. We have to take it to the marketplace. We have to take it to our workplace. We have to take it beyond these walls for it to really be the gospel. So Paul faced a very um, intellectually minded audience. It's very different than some of the things he's come across before. He's dealt with the religious Jews. He's dealt with the the Greek, but now he's dealing with these very high-minded intellectuals in, in this place called the Areopagus. It's essentially the, what, what the, um, how would you call it? Let's call it Harvard. Let's call it Oxford University. These are very intellectually minded people um, that are there. Verse 18, it says, Then certain Epicurean Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be proclaiming of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And I want to make sure you see that. There's some people that will say he, he veered away from what the gospel was and he, he didn't really t- teach it the same way because he was in this unfamiliar area and that's why he wasn't successful there. I don't believe that that's the case because it says very clearly he taught Jesus and the resurrection. The gospel was right at the center of this message and their rejection of it was more to do with them and their thinking than it was his failure, okay? Um, So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new doctrine is that you speak of? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. 
Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. And all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there, get this, they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear about something new. They were hearers only. They were not doers, even of the things that they even taught. But they were, had itching ears that just wanted to hear something new. There's a philosophy, there's a way of thinking that they were dealing with in that place that has spread and still we fight and is rampant in our world and in specifically our society today, right? That we see people are just... Even in the church, people are going from church to church trying to find a place where I can just find a church where they're going to preach what I want to hear. And if I don't like it, guess what? I'm just going to go down the street to find another church that preaches what I want to hear. And itching ears. And the Bible tells us that in the end times, that's going to become even more rampant, right? But then there's also, what exactly is the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers that it speaks of? And I can tell you the Epicureans, they were followers of a belief set by a guy named Epicurus, and he's kind of curious because he was a curious, his philosophy is curious. I wanted to explore all of these, I mean, new things related specifically to luxury, indulgences. They valued the sensual pleasures and the luxury tastes. Physically, they, they loved to drink and they loved to eat new foods is one, one of the things but anything that gave tingled their senses. These guys, if there was mushrooms there, they were probably trying them. And I'm not talking about the type that's, you know, you find out in the, well, I guess you find them in the forest too. I don't know. I've never, I've never done mushrooms. Maybe some of you that grew up in the 60s and 70s know what I'm talking about. But no, I, <laughs> Helen, you're so innocent. I love it. Helen's like, what is he talking about? <laughs> I love you. I love you, Helen. But they were all about, you know, experimenting with things that bring sensual pleasure. And if it feels good, it must be good. Have anyone ever heard that in today's society? So those were the Epicureans. Um, And then there's the Stoics, and they believed that really... um, The best way to put this in, in modern terms is there's a term that came out, I believe, in about 2005. It's um, I've gone blank on the name. It's more of a moral, ethical deism. I think there's a different term for it. I thought about it this morning. But the idea is we're we're just supposed to help other people feel good, right? They, they, this. It's not about doing it for God. It's just about, hey, we're all in this together and peace and I saw this disturbing, very sad, actually, video this week of um, this comedian lady, uh, commentator, and she ended up um, being able to visit with the Pope Um, and the Pope said to her, you make people laugh. You bring joy to people. And that's the most important thing. And it was disturbing. Very disturbing. Like in this lady, right now, if any of you don't know, there's all these um, discussions taking place in the Vatican about how are we going to address uh, the LGBT community because we really need them to come back to the church. And I think it's really, they, they, they feel like people are leaving church and they need to get their, their money somewhere. Uh, there's this fear. There's a concern. I don't know what the, well, I know what the motivation is behind and it's the devil is behind all of this, honestly. So appealing to this comedian that has um, well outspoken toward, with her beliefs on it. And, and that was what he said to her. Like, you know, that's the most important. We just need other people to have joy and happiness. And so if we can just seek joy and happiness, that's the chief end of, of, of man. And so there's this moral theistic deism, that was the word I was looking for, that is rampant, this idea. And um, that's what he was facing. Um, 
So even though he was in a different place, in a different audience, in a different context, his message was the same. Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus and the resurrection. Some mocked him. What is this babbler saying? And so when he went to the actual Areopagus, and you may have heard people refer to this as Mars Hill, that's the location of the Areopagus, um, where they sat and they would have these debates that were mostly just theoretical ideas. Verse 22, it says, Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I passed through and considered the objects of your worship, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. It's, what seems interesting here is he didn't start with an exposition of Old Testament scriptures because that wasn't their frame of reference. That wasn't where they were at. And when we take out the gospel to anyone, we need to find them where they're at and bring them to Christ. So he's instead start with a very general reference to religion. He says, you are the most religious people. And I, you could see this, that he was possibly buttering them up, but I think he was just setting them up. It's like, yes, to find common ground. But he reveals to them, I found this altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Because these seem to be the people that have it all worked out. You ever come across those people who just seem like they seem to think that they've got everything worked out and you can't tell them anything that they don't already know. But deep down, they all know they don't know. They just don't want to admit it. And, and that's one of the hardest things for any of us to get past is our own pride. He was very prideful people. They had all the letters after their names that could have, if they had letters after their names, that these were the guys that would have had that. Well-educated, high flute in mind and thinking. And their pantheon, and this, that's the name of this building, the pantheon, uh, comes from pantheo or multiple gods. So they had all these statues of all the different gods, you know, a god for the trees, a god for the sky, a god for the ocean, a god for, you know, the sand, god for, every, there was a god in everything. Everything is god and god is, is everywhere. Good, bad, it's, it's all the same. So, but they knew they didn't know everything or they just wanted to cover their bases because they had this extra statues like, this is a statue for anything we've not thought of yet. We acknowledge we, there's no way that we can know everything. So out, out, even in their own pride, they had a statue just in case. And so Paul basically says, I, I know who it is that you don't know. Um, verse 24, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might rope to him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Paul started out by speaking with them about God, who created everything, not just a God over one small thing, the God, the one true God over everything. He had to start with the beginning, talking about God and creation and how he created us, and we are a creation of his we don't create him. We don't fashion the statue. And I think that, again, this is, this is something that the world is wrestling with is that people want to create God in their own image rather than realizing that we've been created in his image. That we want 
you know what, I'm going to pick and choose the different parts of whatever world philosophies and religions, and I'm going to put to, and, and that's what I believe. That's my truth. And so I'm going to build this statue, and that's, that's my God. And so he's trying to explain to them that that's not how God works. He created us, not the other way around. So you've got all these statues you've formed into whatever image you think he's like, but that's not how it works. Paul recognized that, he, that there was no way that they could fully understand Jesus, the son of God, until they could correctly understand God. And so that's why we often get into these debates with people because we're trying to explain, no, 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 you have to understand God and creation first before you can understand why there was an even sin and, and that we need salvation, heaven and hell. They didn't have this, even a concept of heaven and hell. They had this idea that when you died, you were freed from this body and then you were just this celestial sort of spirit, some good, some bad, but hey, that's all around us. So you kind of go into that sort of world weird, mystical um, scenarios. And he says to them, he says, for in him we live and we move and we have our being and we are the offspring of Christ. Paul's actually quoting Greek poets. Not because those Greek poets were prophets, but because the specific wording that they used happened to also reflect a biblical truth. And so he used their traditions, the statue of the unknown God, and these old prophets, not prophets, old poets rather, he used their songs to reveal a truth that also existed in the Bible. He used their traditions, which were not biblical. You could say he used their secular songs even. He lifted a, a, war, a, a verse out of their old secular poets. And he says, what they've said means this. And that's almost like the actual truth. And so, you know, we, we do it a lot in the church. The church has done it for a long time. There's lots of elements in, in Christmas and Easter that are actually sort of, there's these pagan traditions. And the church has said, you know what? Pagans, you know how you do this? There's an element of truth in that, not because you came up with it and made it true, but here's what the Bible says it is true. And it's building a bridge. But we need to be careful that we're not just adopting all of this stuff from the world and the pagan traditions and saying, well, it sounds good and it's all just fun and games. No, because if you start doing that and you're dabbling with things that are not, you really can't open doors to the demonic in your life. So I'm saying this to say, be careful, right? Don't open doors unnecessarily, but don't be so afraid of what the world does that we can't even relate to them. Because Paul here, clearly he's read some of their poetry. Clearly he's explored their statues, but he uses it as a bridge to reveal the truth to them. Paul did not go soft with the gospel, just because he could understand and relate to where they were thinking, he was anything but what you would say seeker sensitive. He boldly confronted their wrong ideas that the Athenians had about God, confronted them with the reality of the judgment. Verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because... He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, speaking of Christ. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And I believe that he wasn't finished with his message at this point, but they kind of stopped him in his tracks. He didn't get a chance to fully talk about God's grace and his mercy and forgiveness. He talked about judgment because the, you have to understand you need forgiveness for something. You can't talk about forgiveness if you don't think you've done anything wrong. So he starts with the fact that we all men have sinned. We've sinned. You've sinned. We needed forgiveness. And he was about to probably jump into, and Christ was the sacrifice for us. But they kind of stopped him in his tracks at that point. So it wasn't that he didn't intend on giving the full gospel. And when we get 
caught up debating with people that just want to argue and debate. They have a habit of doing that, stopping you before you actually get to make the actual point because they don't really want to hear. But this wasn't a waste of time. I want to tell you that. What he did here was not a waste. But we can certainly learn from it, as he did. Uh, Verse 32. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others says, will we hear you again on this matter? So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among them. Dionysius of the Areopagite, meaning he was a guy that regularly went to the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. You see, the idea of resurrection was not a popular idea among the Greek philosophers. A lot of them actually saw the, the, the body as kind of something that was holding us back, and the idea of dying, if once you're dead, why would you want your body back? So they didn't really understand that. Some thought Paul's talk was just foolish and uh, for even believing such a thing. It's how it talks about just some ended up believing and some, <laughs> some followed him, and there's a short list of people. Uh, I want to tell you something from the perspective of someone who grew up on the missions field and had to write missions letters to people. Uh, whenever we had big outreaches and we had done lots of things and we, we had to sort of write a letter back to the churches that would help support us, often we would use terminology like we, we, a number of people showed up. <laughs> Some people got saved. And, and to us, it was like, it, that's our way of saying it was really difficult. <laughs> but we want to make you feel like it was worth it. <laughs> and and you, whatever you're do, giving to support the missionaries, like we, we need that support to keep coming. But so when it gives this short list, is like, it was the challenge for him there. But Paul learned from this experience and then he moved on to, to Corinth. Um, and we, when you start reading some of the letters that Paul wrote to these places later or when he was in these places writing them, it helps to flesh out a little bit about his understanding of how he actually felt at the time. First Corinthians 1.18, it even says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And you'll see him that when he moves into Corinth, he was determined that he would share Jesus and the resurrection. More than anything else, rather than getting caught up with debating over all the other stuff, he's like, I tried that and it wasn't as fruitful as I wanted it to be, but he learned from it. And, um, but at the same time, we have to preach to the people where they're at and relate to them where they're at and understand where they're at and let them know we understand where they're at because people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. First seek to understand, then to be understood. Acts 18. So let me pull this map back up, the big map. So again, they've gone to Berea, down to Athens, and it's just a short distance from Athens to Corinth. These, these are kind of almost like twin cities. They're not too far away, but they had a lot of similarities and a lot of differences, but they were almost, it would almost be like, the White Sox and the Cubs, shall we say, right? They, they had some rivalries uh, between them. But that's, that's kind of where he's at in the world right now. It says, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, who was born in Pontius. Let me put that map back up there again. Pontius is way over here above Galatia. So that's where Aquila's from. And he meets them all the way over in Corinth. And it says, they had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla. And Italy, as you know, was off the page to the left-hand side. This is a couple that moved around a little bit, okay? So not everyone in the ancient world are like us today. Some people move around a lot. And some people today, they've never left their hometown or state, right? This was a couple that moved around. Um, 
but they had just come from Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. I love that Luke, when he's writing, he adds in these little details because he doesn't say in the year such and such, such, such. He gives these extra details of historical reference so you get an idea of, of how long it's been and roughly what year it is. I think some, some historians say this means it's probably around the year 52. Um, but uh, because of the... Jews were expelled from Rome at that time because of different riots and uprisings that were taking place at that time. Um, th there's debate over what was causing those uprisings, but the Jews, both Christian Jews and Jewish Jews, were expelled um, from Rome at that time. So because he was of the same trade, verse 3, Paul, he stayed with them, Priscilla and Aquila, and he worked with them, worked with them for by occupation, they were tent makers. Basically, Paul was a tent maker, and so were they. And so he had some common ground with them. Now, uh, we don't know for sure whether they were already saved or not. They may have been. It may be that Paul converted them and through working with them it happened, or it may be that they have been converted earlier. It may have been that they having him being from Pontius. He may have even been down there the day of Pentecost. They may have been saved longer than him, but we don't really know. There's different opinions and debates on that. But uh, one thing we do know is um, it was the beginning of a very good relationship that he had with them. A little bit more about Corinth. This is a major city in the Roman Empire. It was a very important crossroads for trade because it had a port on the north and on the south and a road that connected them between. So instead of having to sail all the way around that whole area, they could bring stuff to the northern port, drop it off, take it to the southern port, and, and take it. And actually, for many, even in the, the first uh, century, there were plans to build a canal between the two so boats could go all the way through. It never actually happened until, uh, like, uh, I, f I forget the numbers, either 15 or 1800 years later. But there was always this plan of doing so. But it was always considered a crossroads of trade and travel, a commercial center, center if you will, um, and a longtime rival with Athens. You know, when we think about the Olympics, we think about Athens. Corinth had their own games as well, uh, called the Is Isthmian Games. Um, but it, w it was a town that was known for its hedonism and immorality, much like Vegas. Okay, actually probably a lot wor worse than Vegas for sure. Um, they had a reputa reputation for loose living, especially with sexual immorality. It, it, throughout the Roman Empire, if you someone called you, oh, you Corinthian you, as kind of a derogatory term or just a slam, you're basically calling, if someone called you, oh, you know, a, we're looking for a Corinthian woman. Basically, it meant I'm looking for a prostitute, okay? Corinth had become infamous for its sinful lifestyle. In the city, there was a temple dedicated to Aphrodite where there were over a 1,000 prostitutes every evening who would leave the a temple and enter into the streets to sell themselves as worship to Aphrodite. Corinth was the kind of city where alternate lifestyles was celebrated and it was commonplace for the rich to throw banquets uh, where every guest would receive their very own prostitute for the night. And that temple didn't only have women, uh, they also had slave boys as well. It was a messed up city. And again, what we're seeing take place in these two cities is prevalent and expanding in the world and society we live in today. And then... God does something amazing. In a city that just has a distorted view of what relationships and love is supposed to look like, and we know that the word love, there's God's love, agape love, there's brotherly love, phileo, and they, they focus definitely on the eros side, which is the physical side of love. God does something amazing. He sends this beautiful couple, Aquila and Priscilla, and the more I read about this couple, the more I like them. And I can't wait to get to heaven. And just, I feel like we'd be good friends, you know? They just seem like a brilliant couple. Um, but Paul found, it says they found him and he came to them. It implies, um, but it's not stated, again, I've mentioned this already, that they were uh, 
whether they were Christians or not by that time, but we do know they were tent makers. And when it says tent makers, essentially they were workers with canvas and fabrics and leather. Um, Paul may have not necessarily worked with leather prior to that. Growing up, if he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, it would have been not okay for him to have touched the skin of dead animals. But perhaps other parts or, or later on after they'd been cleaned, he, he did. But uh, by that time, he probably very well did. But they would build anything with the fabrics for canvas, like a tent or a sail. So knowing that they had the Isthmian games there where people would travel and they'd show up, they would be buying tents for the games, you know. And since it was where boats would come through, people needing new sails. So they were, they were very busy and it was a great place to set up shop because it was people coming and people going, you know. Unlike a lot of the churches where they would go, they would plant and that's where they would be. There was a way of ministering to people while they were there and then they would move on and they would be able to take that gospel lots of different places and minister to different people and they were in this place. Um, but Paul saw this as a time for him to work this secular job, so to speak, a tent making uh, ministry uh, it was important to him. He recognized that he had a right to be supported by those in ministry, but this was a time when he didn't. He actually wrote to the Corinthians later on, 1 Corinthians 9. I'm going to read this, verse 12 through 14. It says, he said, Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right, but we endured anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in its sacrificing offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Um, this is another example of where we have certain freedoms and we have certain rights. We have certain commandments in the Bible for things that we were supposed to do. But as ministers of the gospel, we often lay down our rights because we would rather hear the gospel proclaimed. Here, this is probably the verse that I, I, I look at and I think, well, the workers in the temple, they were paid out of the tithe of the Old Testament. And he's saying in the same way, workers of the gospel should also be paid in the same way. But Paul, in this time, in this season, the church hadn't even been established yet. And there's times and there's seasons where any pastor will know, and some of you may have been pastors, maybe you call, feel like calling pastor, where even though, yes, you shouldn't muzzle an ox, there's some times where we need to not let that be a reason for not sharing the gospel. And so Paul saw this as a time to lay down that command, to lay down that right so that the gospel could be heard by those that were there so that no one could accuse him of seeking converts for the sake of enriching himself. In the modern missions movement, you may even hear people talk about this, like, oh, I'm, that's my tent-making ministry. And someone's like, I didn't know that the world needed so many tents. And, they're not, it's, and it's not that it's literally a tent-making ministry. I said, when, when I worked in the Czech Republic, even though I was a missionary, I worked in a call center. So the call center work was my tent making ministry. And when I was in different locations here in the States, after we returned from the missions field, working as an installer for a security company, that was my tent making ministry. No, I wasn't out there making tents. I was there installing security systems, but it was a way to help provide for my family while I was still ministering in a much smaller church. So when you hear people refer to tent-making ministries, they are referring to what Paul did. Uh, even if the greatest, one of the greatest apostles, maybe the greatest apostle, depending on how you say it, look at it, if he had to work a secular job sometimes for the gospel and his missionary, um, I'm certainly not going to put myself uh, above Paul. Um, Priscilla and Aquila. Paul called them fellow workers who had even risked their own necks for his life. It says in Romans 16, uh, they risked their own necks. It makes you wonder, I'm, I don't think they had the guillotine yet or if they were doing hangings but at that time, but they risked their own necks is the actual words. They put their neck on the line, essentially, for Paul. I don't know exactly how or what, but they were there to serve Paul and minister to Paul. 
it's really interesting that anytime you see this couple in scripture, the six times I think they're mentioned, it never talks about Paul ministering to them, but it only ever talks about them ministering to Paul to support him, to encourage him, to come alongside for him, provide work for him. Of those six times, interesting enough, it, it mentions her name before his four out of the six times. And that was certainly unusual for that to be the case, which makes you believe that it was also intentional. Paul himself, when he's writing to them in the, his Roman letter, because they actually end up going from Pontius to Rome to Corinth, and later on we'll see they go to Ephesus, and then he's writing to them when they're back in Rome again later on. But he's writing to them, and he also mentions her name first. There could be possible reasons for this, maybe family notoriety. Some believe that she may have come from a very affluent family. Uh, possibly just a more charismatic character. Some assume maybe even a more influential ministry. But one thing that we know for sure, they are never mentioned alone. We hear a lot of people, ministers in the gospel, where it talks about his ministry and what he did and what he did, what he did. We, talk, we see lots of different women also in, in the Bible where it talks about them alone. But this is a, this is a beautiful couple. They're always mentioned together. They are a powerful ministry couple and they're an inspiration. A lot of the time when we think about couples, people will focus on what's happening between them, between a husband and a wife. But God has made us not to do something between us, but rather to do something through us. He brings us together with other people because he wants to do something through us rather than something between us. I want to tell you that you can never produce something alone as well as you can produce together. As much as you want to, women, you'll never produce a child on your own. Men, you can never produce a child on your own. It just doesn't work that way. Body of Christ. If we're all just separated little pieces of the body of Christ, we'll never produce what God intends us to produce if we allow the things to divide us that divide us. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to divide marriages. He wants to divide leaders. He wants to divide churches because the devil knows that he can make us ineffective and incapable of producing what God wants us to produce if he can get us to focus on the differences between us rather than focus on what God is trying to do through us. Could it be that you've allowed issues between you and others to stop God from doing something that he wants to do through you. It's a wonderful thing when you get to see a couple ministering together. It was something that both me and Charity had modeled for us by both of our parents, and for that, we're ever grateful. But it's also tragic to see the number of ministers that have fallen away because their best times in their life in their ministry was done with someone else other than their spouse and found themselves connecting with someone, not their spouse. Here's the reality. Marriage is actually quite simple. Number one, husbands, love your wives. Number two, women. Respect and honor your husbands. And number three, pray for each other. Pray with each other. You know, most marriage problems are uh, actually not marriage problems. Most marriage problems are actually just obedience problems. And if we can do those three things or not. And if we're having marriage problems, those would be the three things for us to look at. Do those three things, and I promise you, those problems won't be problems anymore. It's an obedience problem. So, verse four. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Anyone curse? See? Ouch, that one was quiet. I was like, maybe write that down. Husbands, love your wife. Wife, respect and honor your husband. Three, pray with each other. God wants to do something through you, and you're allowing something that's going on between you. And I say marriages, but like I said, it, it relates to the body of Christ as well. God wants to do something through the body of Christ, and we're busy doing, being distracted by each other. Watch this video this last week, and it showed these two gazelle that were fighting each other. 
And in the background, it showed this lion that's just... And they're just fighting right in the middle. And, and they didn't realize it until one of them already had the lion mouth all the way around. And the other's like, oh, snap, I'm out of here. And so busy fighting each other that we miss out on who the real enemy is. Verse four, so he reasoned in the synagogues and every Sabbath persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy had finally arrived from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the spirit. Now, again, that's, that was one of those lines that kind of popped off and comparing that to how his spirit kind of compelled him to speak in Athens. But here it says he was compelled by the spirit. But some of the translations might even say, when they arrived, he then devoted himself exclusively to preaching or he, his time was occupied by testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Basically, once his companions came and helped bring support, and we actually know that the churches in Thessalonica actually did send financial support so that he was able to do that uh, dedicated time as well for that season. Paul was filled with joy and he wrote First Thessalonians actually while he was in Corinth already there as well. Um, and we know that he received support. You can read that in Second Corinthians 11, but I'm, I'm gonna move on. Um, j just like everywhere else, eventually opposition rose in Corinth too, verse six. When they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. And from now on, I'm just gonna go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there, get this, and he entered into the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was right next door to the synagogue. <laughs> I just find that funny. But then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and all of his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized, not just some, but many. And I, I just love it that even though he shook off the dust, he's like, I'm not even gonna mess with you guys anymore. I'm gonna go next door and I'm gonna preach over here. Um, even though he changed his attention, his focus to the Gentiles, he is still loving and compassionate. And when Crispus, the guy who was a leader next door, came over, says, I, I want in. He says, come on in. He didn't say, no, you had your chance, you're barred, you're not allowed in. Crispus. It says they blasphemed, and, and now they're not blasphemed against Paul and just calling him names. They're actually blasphemed because you can't really blaspheme against a human, but unless they're saying, you think you're God, you're whatever, but or, or they said some, you see, you hear some people that get upset and disagree, say absolutely nasty things about Jesus. You know, and thinking about the context, these Corinthians, maybe some of the things that they might have tried to say about Jesus, he's like, you know what? You're, you're saying stuff that might get you struck by lightning or the earth open up and swallow you because I believe in a Bible that tells me, you know, when talk, <laughs> these things have happened. So uh, I'm not going to be anywhere near you when this happens. <laughs> so he, he moves on. Um, he really put into practice what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 6. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under feet and turn and tear you to pieces. When people have determined to reject the gospel, shake the dust off them and go next door. It kind of makes me think about how when Jesus told his disciples, just put your net on the other side of the boat. Don't stop fishing. Don't give up. A lot of us, when we get, have a rejection, like, well, that didn't work. I just don't think I'm gonna ever do that again. Just because you shared the gospel once and you didn't get a result, that doesn't mean stop fishing. Just put the net on the other side. You might be so close. You might be in Athens and all you need to do is walk a little bit to get to Corinth. You might be putting your net down here when you need to put it down here. You might be walking to a cashier and you're like, man, I feel like I'm supposed to say something and you really just should have been one line over. So next time you go to, go to the, someone else, but be obedient. I kind of want to close with, with this last one. There, there's several other things I could go on to, um, but um, this last verse that I want to share today is, is 
I think, abundantly clear with something God is saying to us today. Um, but I still wanted to be obedient to go through the word. But what we see happen in verse 9, and you'll, you'll see why I, I, I'm saying what I'm saying. Um, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, and he said, Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent. Why? For I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you because I have many people in the city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. He's having success. People are getting saved. And the spirit comes to him and says, don't be afraid. Why is he afraid? He's having success. Why would God tell you not to be afraid? Because you're afraid. <laughs> God's not going to tell you, don't be afraid, unless he actually did have some fear. Why was he afraid, though, right? Perhaps he was afraid because of previous experiences where he had seen success, like when, when the Thessalonians came to Berea or when the, those from Antioch and Iconium came and agitated when he was in, in um, Derby and Lystra. He said, don't be afraid, but keep speaking. Don't keep silent. Like I said, often when we don't get the results we want, our normal habit is, well, I guess I'm never gonna do that again. He says, don't stop. You may have been hurt in the past. You may have got, felt like it wasn't successful. Don't stop. No one's gonna attack you. Why? I have many people in the city. I want you to tell you, that this is one of the biggest lies of the enemy. You're all on your own. Oh yeah, God cares for you, but you can't even see him. You're all on your own. That's what the devil wants to tell you. And, and, and God says, Paul, I got lots of brothers and sisters there for you in that city. And if when you leave, I know you feel like that, that area, that really needs Jesus. I got other people there. Even when you leave, I got it. I'm the one that takes that seed that's been planted and causes it to grow. One man plants a seed, another one waters it. Another one gets to harvest it. Don't be afraid. He continued there a year and six months. This is one of the longest times he was ever actually in a place, especially on this mission's journey. There's another time when the Jews, they tried to uprise, and it says that even when Paul was about to open his mouth, uh, the proconsul basically spoke up on his behalf. There's so many different amazing things that God does, but um, actually funny thing with that story is, is when the Jews tried to bring that accusation against Paul and the proconsul defended Paul, the, the Jews turned around and they actually grabbed their, uh, their new leader of the, of the synagogue, Sothenes, who was the new ruler of the synagogue, and says, and they beat him up before the seat of the proconsul. <laughs> What's crazy is that this guy, Sosthenes, who had replaced Crispus, remember the guy who was the leader who came, he came over? Sosthenes is one of the guys that Paul ends up greeting in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. He, he, he becomes a believer too. The world loves to beat up on their own. <laughs> and it's those lost, those that have been hurt and beat up by the world that turn to Christ. And that's where we need to drop our nets. The people that think they've got it all worked out, we take the gospel to them because we're told to. And when they reject it, drop our nets on the other side, find the lost, find the lost. There are some people that, that the seed's been planted in their life a long time ago and it's been watered periodically and, and they're ready to be harvested. I wanna tell you, I believe that with everything that's going on in the world, the day of his return grows nearer. And 
whether he comes tomorrow or next year or in 10 years, the world is seeing the signs. The people that have had seeds planted in their life, they know, they sense the whole world is groaning. And I'm telling you, the harvest is ripe in a lot of people's lives. Keep your eyes open. I, 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 with everything that's going on in the world today, I really want to just take a message and unpack all of this stuff that's going on with prophecy. But I, I felt God has set us on this path to work our way through Acts for a reason. Because he wants us to be the church that is obedient and doing these things today. And be encouraged. He's seeing fruit come out of just speaking the word. Acts is an interesting book because it moves, it's almost a transitional book where we see people had a lot of success because they had all these signs and wonders and miracles. But at this point, he's ministering in a totally different place and he's speaking the word. It doesn't say he went there and he ministered and the healings and lots of people. No, he's sharing the word and many came. So don't feel like you're less than because you don't have all these mystical, spirit-filled powers. We should seek them, yes, but that doesn't stop us. The word, being obedient, loving people. The world needs to have his love. The world needs to see us lay down some of our rights for them, to care for them and put others before ourselves. Let me close with this verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 19. It kind of really helps summarize this all. We, we see Paul throughout this journey. I didn't even get to talk about it, but on this journey, he even had taken a Nazarite vow at one point. He's grown his hair. And, and so we see that on this journey, Timothy's being circumcised. Paul has become an Athenian historian, poet, philosopher. Paul has become a tent maker. Paul's taken a Nazarite vow. He's become all things to all people. What does that mean? He tells us in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. He says, for... Even though I am free from all, I have made my servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. Though I'm not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law not being outside of the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessing. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you that it does speak to us, Lord, in the way that only you know, do know how. But I also receive your command and your instruction for us to share your truth and share your love and to reach out to people that may be different than us and find our way to, to understand them in the same way that Paul did. With such a passion and a willingness to adapt to his scenarios and his circumstances and not just slam the door on people that were lost, but even being obedient to take the gospel to those who seemed stubborn because even there, Lord, there are some that hear and there's some that will receive and I know your will is that all might hear and all might receive and that those rejections, Father God, it's not a rejection of us but they have already chosen and hate you. Thank you for your word that reminds us that we're not alone. That you have placed brothers and sisters in our life to come alongside us and to help us and work with us and minister to us. Let us focus on what you want to do through us instead of bickering between us. Jesus, we thank you for dying for us on the cross. We thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for the simplicity of your gospel. That even though we were still sinners, you came to us while we were lost and broken 
and afraid. And you said, I, you, you don't need to be afraid because I am with you. Yes, the storms may rise and they will rise and they will come against you, but I am with you. Lord, I pray that you would bless your children as they go today. They, they would go filled with encouragement and the knowledge that you are with them. Bless them with what they do as they obey you, Father. To love you, the Lord their God, with all of their heart. To love their neighbor even more than themselves. Prompt their heart, Father, this week on exactly what that looks like to love their neighbor and love their enemy and love those that persecute you. And in all things, we say thank you and we rejoice because we already have our hope in you and eternal life that there is nothing that can happen to this world or in this world as long as we put our trust and our faith and our hope in you, Father God, we have assurance that we'll be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.